Hello, and welcome to episode number 145 of A Mic on the Podium with me, Michael Seal. Before we start, I want to thank my latest Patreon subscriber, Oliver, for his support and all my other Patreon subscribers for their continued support. This podcast would struggle to continue without them, and my Patreon page has become a great place to learn about and to chat about all aspects of conducting. There'll be more about my Patreon page later on in this episode. Today, I conduct a conversation with an American conductor who studied at Juilliard and Aspen, and was the first recipient of the Sir George Schulte Emerging Conductor Award. He's held title positions in the US and Sweden, and is currently the music director of the Crash Ensemble in Ireland. It's a great pleasure to welcome Ryan McAdams. Ryan, it is an absolute joy to speak to you today. Uh, How are you? I'm terrific. Um, Fair warning, it it is the end of half term. And yes. I, there is a four-year-old in my house who is, um, who, who is mine. I take ownership of him. Oh, oh that's all um, right. Then. Not just a random but... four-year-old. <laughs> no, no, no. They don't just wander in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he has, because he is not being intellectually exhausted at school, he has been waking up every morning at about 5 a.m. with projects for me. Yeah. Oh, uh, this, this week has been trying to learn all the words to, I am the very model of a modern major general, which he has accomplished. Um, and it, it, usually I have endless resources of energy and joy for him, but there is in the at 5 a.m. There's definitely like an Eeyore Tigger vibe to the house. <laughs> I bet so there my, is. My brain is a bit jello at the moment, but I right. will. Well, well, whilst you sip uh, sip your, I don't know, fourth, fifth cup of coffee of the day. Um, <laughs> and it sounds like, uh, you know, your four year old is very much into music already. I'm going to go right back to the beginning and find out when music first came into your world and how and if you got musical parents or it just was a bolt out of the blue. What happened? You know, I love those stories of, uh, you know, people who just d- who somehow stumbled on it, like, you know, the the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the desert and all of a sudden they're imbued with power. Um, but no, I was surrounded by it from the very beginning. Um, I always say that I there was no hope for me because my mother was an opera singer and my father was a semi-professional theater director. Right. Um, he had he actually had a professional job in the business world um, that I did not understand when I was a child and couldn't have cared less about because my other great passion in life aside from music is theater. Um, but <laughs> he's passed away a few years ago. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that what he did is actually much more um, is much more meaningful to conducting than his theater directing, which was he was a, a an incentive plan uh, designer. He was a national leader in compensation. Yeah. And he his job was to figure out how to motivate employees to give the best of themselves in ways that weren't just an extra bonus check at Christmas. Yeah. Um, thankfully, he wrote five or six books on the subject, so I've been able to go back and, and try to uh, learn from him. But yeah, my mother was an opera singer uh, at Opera Theatre of St. Louis when I was growing up. And not only, you know, was there music in the house all the time, but my parents divorced when they were, when I was really young, when I was about four. And so my mother was a single mother who would pick me up from school or um, during summer vacations and literally just deposit me in a chair in the wings at Opera Theatre St. Louis. I had <laughs> I had the best attention span of any six-year-old uh, that has ever lived. Um, but I would sit there and just watch the productions for mm. hours at a time. And so, you know, we singers would come around the house and there'd be late night parties of, you know, Gilbert and Sullivan marathons that lasted until three or four in the morning. And And I think there was a moment probably when I was a teenager where I I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to be a conductor or I wanted to be an actor and thank God for you know for the theatrical world I decided to go to conducting though sorry for all the musicians in the world but hmm. it's it's um it was wonderful I started taking piano when I was about five or six and then I became my mother actually started a kind of amateur opera company in St. Louis and I became the, you know, head coach yeah. and pianist for it when I was about, I don't know, 12. Um, and we did, you know, we did everything. We did all the Mozarts. We did Minotti operas. At one point she decided to do a whole act of Tosca, you know, and it was just, it was the best possible education for a, for a kid. 
That sounds great. I mean, that sort of being a repetitor slash coach that early is reminding me of Sir Antonio Papano. I think he had a similar sort of experience of, you know, of learning the piano and and being in a place where he he just became the go-to pianist at a very young age. And, and... Well, and his father was a terrific singer as well, wasn't yeah, he? I mean, yeah. I think you develop, it's wonderful to have developed such empathy for singers and for their for their technique. And, and the truth is, I only ever wanted to be an opera conductor when I was younger. Mm. Everything that's happened in my career since has been, um, has sort of not come out of nowhere. I mean, I can see where I laid those seeds and they flowered later on. Um, but yeah, I think because of the fact that I grew up, literally grew up in an opera house and my father was a theater director, I tend to approach everything very, uh, from a, from a storytelling perspective, from a, from a theatrical perspective, yeah. almost yeah. more than anything else. Yeah. But the, 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 the cost of that, of course, is that, you know, I didn't grow up playing in youth orchestras. I didn't yeah. grow up with the orchestral psychology. I grew up with singer psychology. And so I had to kind of take time in school and when I was younger to find opportunities to be conducted, to be in an orchestra, to sit on the other side of that and um, and understand, you know, the 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 effects, positive and deleterious <laughs> that that <laughs> someone in our position can can have. Well, exactly. Uh, I mean, if I go ahead, you studied piano at Indiana University, but you just said that from the age of sort of 14, you knew that conducting was something that you were very interested in. When you were studying the piano at Indiana, did you, were you already by then, were you conducting things? I literally came in the first day of my first lesson with Karen Shaw, who was my piano teacher. Karen Shaw, she was this, I, I, my memory has exaggerated, but my memory says that she was about four foot two. Um, she was this <laughs> tiny little woman who was the, one of the greatest Liszt and Rachmaninoff pianists uh, America has ever produced. And I came in the very first day and I said, look, I, I really want to take these studies very seriously, but I mm. want to be a conductor. And the reason I'm getting this degree is because there is no undergraduate degree yes. in conducting. And she said, uh, so I just said, look, I, I promise you if, if it takes an extra week for my, you know, uh, Hungarian Rhapsody or, or Beethoven or, you know, Wallstein to, to, to materialize, I promise you I'm, I'm working in this other direction. And she came actually in the, my first year there to a couple of concerts that I organized and God bless her. Sorry for the al alarms. I, I live in Brighton and there's just madness happening yeah. <laughs> up and down a Marine parade here. Um, and she came and she was amazingly supportive. She saw some concerts. She said, yep, this is what you're going to do. Yeah. And it was, it was wonderful. I mean, I, I, and, and then our, it was great that our lessons didn't have the burden of expecting me to become a professional pianist. Yes. She yeah, could, yeah. We could just talk about music and we could just explore different attitudes and different approaches to style without her feeling like, you know, she had to prepare me for the Van Cliburn competition or something, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and then of course at, at IU, all I did was accompany singers. I mean, I just, I just bribed my way into every studio and to sing in every opera um, in every opera course that I could. I mean, and, you know, one of the things, you know, you talk about that, like, Promethean moment of being a conductor, like, I think I was probably 11 or 12, when I kind of figured out th that the conductor was there in the mm. opera house, that there was this person who was at the you know, was at the nexus of of the stage and the orchestra who got to live all the moments in between the action um, in this full way. And I thought, well, there's nothing nothing better than that. And I was really lucky because there was the guy who was running, who was kind of the artistic director of Opera Theatre of St. Louis at the time was a British director named Colin Graham, who premiered almost all of Britain's operas. Right. And so I got to learn... I got to watch him work. He was brilliant director. And I also got to know Benjamin Britten's operas very, very well um, as a result. And that's just stuck with me mm. for the rest of my life. Before we go on to 2006 and studying uh, and getting a master's at Juilliard, if you were conducting at uh, Indiana University and wanted to before, had you had any lessons? Were you getting any lessons from anybody? Or were you doing sort of what I was doing, which was just sort of picking stuff up and, and you know, learning by mistakes? <laughs> well, learning by mistakes is the only yeah. way through this field. Absolutely. Um, 
if you if you emerge without numerous uh, numerous scars, I think something's gone terribly wrong. But I was, I mean, we it was easy at a place like Indiana University, which was which is the biggest music school in the country in America. It's pretty easy to get an orchestra together on a Sunday evening with the promises of pizza and soda <laughs> or other <laughs> other drinks um, and do readings of of, you know, Beethoven symphonies or Strauss tone poems or or whatever. Um, but my first I was actually I've had so many amazing, fortunate experiences to work with great to being close to great conductors and great mentors. And my first was when I was about 15, my mother had stopped singing professionally and was actually switching careers to become a choral conductor. Mm. And at the time in St. Louis, the, the chorus master in St. Louis was Donald Palumbo, who is now just retiring a, a, a pretty august uh, yeah. reign as the chorus master of the Met. Um, and he, at that time, had moved from St. Louis to Chicago, to the Chicago Lyric. And so she was driving up every week from St. Louis to Chicago, which is about five and a half hours, which is, wow. you know, in America, that's nothing. I know in yeah. this country, it's like the Iditarod. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> in, in America, that's, that's a pretty short journey. Um, and so she was working at the Chicago Lyric, studying with him. And there were only a couple times where she would call me and say there's this amazing thing happening I'm going to come down to St. Louis I'm going to pick you up and we're going to spend the weekend um, seeing this and the first was a marriage of Figaro that Zubin Mehta was conducting with Renee Fleming and Bryn Terrell and oh. you know uh, uh, I think uh, I think Susan Graham and Hakan Hagegaard and it was just this this you know that's that's um, the who's who of yeah all star cast yeah <laughs> the best yeah. people you know in in the mid nineties you know and uh, I went up and I don't know where I got the I don't know where I got the absolute chutzpah um, as my rabbi would say <laughs> to do this but during the breaks of the staging rehearsals she would sneak me into the theater and I would watch the staging rehearsals and I just went up and asked Meta questions mm. I don't know why he answered them I don't know <laughs> whether he felt like he had to, but he he answered my questions really thoughtfully and kindly because there was a lot happening. It was like a it was a technical rehearsal, so he was sitting around a lot. And honestly, yeah. maybe he just <laughs> wanted something to do with his mind. Um, but we ended up actually becoming quite close. And when I was at Indiana University, I spent a semester in in Vienna, and most of that time was actually just traveling to Munich when he was music director of the Bayerische Staatsoper just watching his rehearsals and studying scores. So he was kind of the first person that I got close to and and his technique stayed in my body. I mean, it's still <laughs> it's still kind of one of the tools in the Swiss Army knife that I'll pop out if something's going wrong. Yes. It tends to fix a lot of problems. Um, but yeah, I, I started to work with him on and off when when we were kind of in the same time zone. And then at Indiana University, I spent, a, as I said, I spent a semester abroad in Vienna, which was really transformative. Um, mm. I studied conducting with someone from the Vienna Philharmonic, but the most transformative was I had gone there with my best friend who was a, a, a baritone and we worked with a, a Viennese ec leader expert. We worked through all of the Schubert and Schumann song cycles. And that I think developed me as a musician more than almost anything else that I've had in my life. And while I was there, I organized, you know, like at least write a soldat or just put some things together and made a tape. And I came back to IU and I sent the tape to the conducting faculty at Indiana. And I said, can I, you know, what can I do? And they were so sweet. They called me that night and said, look, we would love to have you in the program, but you you don't have an undergraduate degree. You can't yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> take our classes. Yeah. They said, but we'll make you a deal. If you come in and be one of the pianists for the conducting class, we'll let you audit all of our classes. So yeah. by the time I actually graduated, um, I had actually done the coursework for a, a master's program in conducting, but I'd never actually really conducted except for the things that I was organizing. And the yeah. first full-sized orchestra I ever conducted was my Juilliard audition. Yeah. Wow. 
which was well, it was uh, glorification of the chosen one. And let me tell you, yeah, <laughs> I still wake up. I still wake up with nightmares about it. But what you'd done is you'd read, you know, it's a, in, in sort of metaphorical terms, you'd read every handbook there possibly was, and you'd been tutored by all of the best people on on how to do it before actually starting it. You know, which is. Which is which is a good start. I mean, it's more than. I mean, I suppose I had the same. I was watching these people from twelve feet away. You know, yeah. Rattle, uh, Gergia, Boulez. Uh, I could list the people who I played for, and I was watching them from twelve feet away. But I wasn't actually doing any of that until a little bit later in my life. And then, you know, those things will inform you much as the way. You know, eventually when you 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 start conducting regularly at Juilliard, those experiences before Juilliard will inform you as well as what you're being taught. I'm assuming by Alan Gilbert at Juilliard. I couldn't find out for definite who it was. Um, no, actually, it was no? James. It was James De Priest. Right. Um, he and I came in actually in the same year. But I just to, to follow up from what you said, I think you're absolutely right. And you had, I think, the best experience, which was not only were you getting to watch these people up close, but you were part of the alchemy that they were manifesting. So you mm -hmm. you knew instinctively and from a from such a visceral, tactile way whether what they were offering was how it was affecting people and how it was making you listen and and pay attention i think the downside if i'm mean, not to be uh, you know um not to be ungrateful for anything <laughs> that i've experienced but the downside is if you only are thinking of it theoretically you don't know what you don't know yes um and it can take you a long time of, of actual practical work to realize that um you know the videos that you watched of conductors that you loved told were just such the tip of the iceberg of what the actual job is and what the actual artistry is. Mm. Um, and then you go back and see them with a completely different eye or respect for what they must have manifested in, in, in rehearsal or through their own just personal energy. Um, but yeah, James de Priest, just a, a, I don't know how often he came over to the UK. I don't know if you ever got a chance to work with him. No, never played for him. No, no. He, he was quite a miraculous human being um more charisma than a supernova i mean just a, a an absolutely extraordinary person persona he he had never taught conducting i had never studied conducting mm -hmm. seriously you know with someone actually looking at my hands and watching a rehearsal and <laughs> i came to audition for him and i it, to my shame i didn't want to go to juilliard Right. I actually wanted to go to Curtis and work with Otto Werner Mueller. And I mm. took the Juliet audition thinking it would be a really good uh, warm up yeah, yeah. <laughs> for Curtis. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I tried so out actually, for the big one. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I don't want to go here. I, and so I was quite relaxed about it. And I remember later on, he told me part of the reason he accepted me was when we had the interview that was face to face. And after we had done some of the early rounds, he, we, we chatted for about an hour. And then at the end, he said, do you have any more questions? And I said, yeah, Christopher Plummer is doing King Lear next door at Lincoln Center. Do you, do you guys have any access to tickets? <laughs> <laughs> and he, he thought that was such a preposterous question, um, but he was kind of charmed by it, I think. <laughs> um, but then we ended up talking for about another half hour about Shakespeare and storytelling. And and I think what the reason why he liked that was so much of what he taught and what he had to offer was about language mm. and the way you use language. He was a published poet and his poems are like haikus. I mean, there's right. every word is so chosen with such care and such clarity. And one of the things that he tried to pass on to us was, you know, always have a, a technical solution ready, mm. but if you can with a word or two, inspire people's imaginations. Even if everyone has a different interpretation of whatever adjective you just threw out, if you can make everyone lean forward and, and give you something, uh, that's always the, the preferred way of doing it because it conveys ownership. Mm. Um, and 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 so it was, it was magical. So I came in, um, I was only one of two people he accepted. One was a much older conductor who was in a, a slightly separate program. And the other three conductors had been kind of abandoned by right. Otto Werner Mueller. Mm. And it was fascinating um, because they weren't his students and yeah. he had to kind of adapt to, to them. And then, but he would call me every week and say, 
what do you want to do this week in the lab orchestra? And I'd say, I don't know. Verklärte to Nacht? Great, let's do it. Um, <laughs> or I'd say, I'd say Don Giovanni. He said, great, I never conducted that opera. Let's get someone from, you know, New York City Opera of the Met in here yeah. to, to teach you. And so we just kind of made it up as we went along. Sounds great. It sounds perfect, it really, because you've got that what you know that one. To, and it wasn't formulaic. To, to it sounds like he's <laughs> you know uh, very much uh, working on the hoof. But I think we, we need that as conducting students. We need somebody to look at us individually. Um, but also, it's a, it's good to go into a class of four or five people and see how other people's problems are fixed or sorted. Or I'm going to go back on something you said because it's burning. It, it's burning in my head. You were talking about me as a player. And being in the middle of that and understanding how the gestures from conductors and and much like James the Priest, how the words of a of the conductor is used can change the orchestra and understanding it from within. Absolutely true. But there were many times when I realized the orchestra was playing completely differently and I had no idea why. And I'd be looking <laughs> up at the conductor and trying to work out why. Whereas I think many of my colleagues probably didn't. They probably realized we were playing better, but didn't under weren't interested in knowing why. I was, and sometimes I never figured it out, but sometimes I did. I thought you'd sit there and go, well, something's changed, but I don't really know how. What are you doing to to affect that? And so I would look at that. Um, you know, I, I was, uh, the, the analogy I often use is I didn't learn to drive until I was 30, but I was never one of these who was sitting on the back seat reading Hello Magazine. I, I was always watching to see what the <laughs> what the driver was looking at and how they were yeah. reacting to the traffic around me. And, and as a fiddle right. player, I was the same. So, but hopefully not watching like NASCAR or Formula One. No, 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 no. <laughs> no definitely not. No. Uh, g going on from Juilliard, I mean, three. But, but can big... I just follow up on that? Because Absolutely, that's such a great yeah, point, yeah, yeah. Which is, I, I do as I get. Um, I mean, I just, I'm about to turn forty-two. I've been doing this now for about twenty years. It's, I, I, it's amazing how so much of what I feel the job is now is just trying to understand what these orchestras already do so well by themselves and facilitating that. And when that really works, then the orchestra is playing better, but they feel like themselves. They don't feel like they're being uh, dictated to in any way. Mm -hmm. And I find so much of it is, is just being at the right place at the right time. You know, I, one of my, my big heroes and mentors um, is David Robertson. I think he's, he's intellectualized this craft in a way that is fascinating to me, even if, um, even if, you know, I there it's not the first recording I'd buy. Um, and he said a great thing about conducting, which is the first rehearsal is like, is a bit like being a kid with a paper route. I don't know if this is a thing in the UK. Yeah, where, it used to be. Least, I'm, not, it, I'm not sure whether it still is, but I mean, I was a paper boy. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, um, you know, you get up at six and you throw the, throw the newspaper into people's yards and, and you know, cause some property damage. But <laughs> I, he said it was a bit like, your job is to throw the paper in through the window and have it land on people's laps so they can read the news. And the question is, when do people's windows go up? When do people take in information? Because everyone takes in information at a different time. Some people will look up right before they play to mm -hmm. get, a, a, you know, a, 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 an idea or a cue or a gesture or a character, and then they'll just play. And some people will stare at you the whole time they're playing, which uh, is is a, a, a big responsibility. Yeah. And and then ninety percent of people will look at after they play to mm. see if there's anything back. And the first job is actually just to figure out when do people's windows open so that you can be in contact with them. And I think when that's done properly, it's kind of an invisible thing because mm. people look up, they see you there when they need you, they go back down, and they don't even process it so and what's interesting about that is you know we have a shared experience with uh the five students in glasgow uh at yeah. the royal conservatory of scotland and after a couple of days of rehearsing the symphony orchestra there i said to the five of them don't sit behind me i tr you know that you've already told me plenty about the balance come and sit in the orchestra and watch because you're missing what i'm look who i'm looking at after they've played yeah. solos before they played solos while they're playing solos come and see what i'm doing with my eyes because you don't get that from behind you don't get that from the auditorium and, and it's a very important thing that you need to pick up on it's 
it's the most eye contact is so fundamental. And when you're, I, I had said to them, the students, when I saw, met them in Glasgow, I have so much sympathy for them because the hardest thing about being a conductor is being a young conductor, because it's it's like having imposter syndrome every day of your life, but you're right. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. um, but I, and it, 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 eye contact can be very difficult if you're anxious and young, because you look into these eyes and you don't know how to read them or your anxiety manifests a narrative about what they're feeling. And actually it was, it was Alan Gilbert later on when I worked with him who said, you know, if you look out into a sea of faces in an orchestra and you think that they're unhappy and you think it's because of you, that is kind of the peak of narcissism. You are not actually <laughs> important enough to them to ruin their day, no. um, you know, in this way. And, 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 it, and what I've discovered overall is like, often when I'm rehearsing an orchestra, when I was younger in my twenties, you know, you'd have those eyes and I think, oh, that person doesn't like me. That person doesn't like me. That person's unhappy. And then those are inevitably the people who come to you in the dressing room afterwards and say, oh, thank you for such a great week. It was such a pleasure. And you're like, really? Mm. Um, and then you learn, oh, this, this, the, the narratives we put on players' faces is often just our own subconscious betraying us. Um, but yeah, I think I remember when I was, uh, I was at Interlochen, um, the summer school for the arts when I was a teenager. And I know a lot of my American colleagues have talked about Larry Ratcliffe mm. on this podcast. Um, he came uh, to do Shostakovich 11. And we were in a conducting class. I was actually in a conducting class with uh, Christy. Um, oh, Marcellaro. Marcellaro. Yeah, yeah Marcellaro. He and I were kind of finding our feet in the water at the same time. And Larry came and the first verse, and one of the great things about this class was they let us sit in the orchestra. We mm -hmm. could just pull up a chair next to the, you know, in the middle of the violas and watch. And I remember Larry came and I think he said like five words, the whole first rehearsal. And it was the most thrilling experience of my life. Mm -hmm. And, um, but being able to just sit in that orchestra. And then when I got to Juilliard, um, I just begged them to let me be the orchestra pianist mm -hmm. so that I could have that experience because I, I knew I had no business um, running a rehearsal if I hadn't been in their, in their shoes. But, and I, can I refer, if we're talking about players' facial gestures or the, how they look, can I refer that you, dear listener, back to the Mark Stringer episode who tells a wonderful story about an oboist in Switzerland who he thought hated him for the entire time he was there. It just turned <laughs> out he had a terrible case of hemorrhoids. Um, so uh, yeah, please please go back and listen to that story to discover how sometimes you can look at a person's face and you're not getting the full picture. You um, have no idea. No, exactly. I was going to go on and, and mention three big American conducting names who feature in your studies, but also in that time when we're leaving education and we're going out and becoming you know, young guest conductors or young conductors. So in 05 and 06, he went to Aspen and studied under David Zidman, winning a prize there. Uh, I can't read my own writing. I think it's the Glimmer Glass Aspen Prize for Opera Conducting. Then in 07, apprentice conductor to Lauren Marzell, and in 09, Tanglewood with uh, James Levine. What did those three, and of, and of course, going on or around this time also in 06, you were apprentice conductor for a whole year, as you've just said, with Alan Gilbert and the Royal Stockholm Philharmonic. So there are four extra names there to add on top of James De Priest. What were you sort of getting from them? I mean, were, were any of them particularly hot on hands and arms or mm. facial gestures, or were, was it a lot more about study or even approach? What did you do? You think you you might rely on from any of those now? Now, now you're on your own, like we all are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yes, no man is an island except conductors on planes, <laughs> yeah. studying scores. Yeah. Um, you know, the problem I have with answering that question is the problem I've had my whole life, which is distilling all of the things that the whole of those people tried to inject into me and then uh coming up with something that feels authentic and natural mm. to to myself i mean the thing about de priest i'll talk about those conductors in relationship i think to de priest de priest did not believe in conducting technique at all right not not that he thought that there wasn't good or bad technique but he believed that it was something that you just develop over time Mm. Um, you know, and, and to some extent, I kind of agree with that. And, you know, I think that there are technical issues that young students have that can be corrected or, you know, a, a word of advice from a player can, can change. But I often think that teachers who are 
too technical with young students, I'm a little suspicious of, <laughs> um, mm. because I think they may not have much else to offer. But more importantly, I just think those classes are a bit like, they can sometimes be a bit like those classes you used to be able to take that like taught you how to be a good conversationalist at cocktail parties, you know, yeah, yes. just like a good, yeah. a good representative for yourself until your actual personality shows up. Yeah. Um, and so it does take some time to, to just work out how your hands work and how you respond to other people. I, I had a friend of mine who once said that every conductor, no matter how talented they are, it takes two years of conducting every week to figure out how your hands work, two years to figure out how to actually hear what's in front of you and another two years to basically figure out how to rehearse. And no matter how talented you are, there's kind of no leapfrogging that period of time. And of yeah. course, some people can bend it, you know, one way or the other. But I, I I do think that there's some truth to it. And with technique, honestly, now at 42, when I feel very comfortable in my body, now is the time I kind of want to go back mm -hmm. and start working on my technique um, in, in a much more sophisticated way. But to your question, um, De Priest was everything for him was about language and having a clear concept of what you want that was motivated by your understanding of the score. So one of the things he did, his main text was Gunter Schuller's The Complete Conductor, mm. which doesn't really talk about technique of any kind. What it does is it just takes, you know, it takes one piece and 700 recordings and it goes bar by bar comparing every single conductor's ideas and then making a case for them or against. And so at Juilliard, he would give us three or four recordings of a piece. We didn't know who the conductors were and we would have to write papers mm. in which we would, every time the con performance deviated from the score, we had to argue it from both sides. Right. We, and it could, and it wasn't good enough to just say, well, don't do that because the score doesn't say that. We actually had to make a structural case for why <laughs> Bernstein takes the last moment of the Pathetic Symphony twice as slow as it's marked. You know, yeah, yeah, we yeah, had, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had yeah. to get into the, the attitude of it because he believed that when, if orchestra players, um, in order to get orchestra players to trust you, they have to feel that your first priority is from the score. And, and I've discovered this that when people come up and ask you questions about why are you doing it this way or that way, if I answer immediately with something that comes from the score, they almost immediately go, oh, great. They just mm. wanted to know that I knew the score, <laughs> that I wasn't unconscious in yes. the decisions I was making. Um, so that was, it was all about language. So then I went to Aspen and I worked with Zinman. And the problem, I mean, Zinman is it's such an extraordinary musician. And I think the thing that he taught me more than anyone else was to trust what the score says. Uh, you know, he was the first person to record the, the, the Beethoven symphonies, the new editions with all of the metronome markings. Mm, mm. Um, and everything was about really understanding that your authority in the rehearsal room comes from um, trying to realize exactly what's on the page, mm. which is not, you know, ideal in every situation. Also, you have issues with editions and, and copyright errors and, you know, Ill illegible manuscripts. But that was the way I think that a lot of us gained our sense of calm and confidence on the podium was, you know, we knew we were conducting our colleagues who were the same age as us at Aspen, who probably had been working with Gergiev and you know, Rattle and who else in summer yeah. festivals when they were 15. We knew we had no business up there trying to teach them anything. But if we could go after really what was in the score, then there was a, a sense of purity and cohesion to the to the effort. Um, the problem with Zinman was that his technique was so imitatable. Right. And if... <laughs> everyone who went to study with Zinman ended up looking like Zinman at the end of the summer. And the right. problem was his technique really works. Yeah. <laughs> and so then we had to kind of unlearn it <laughs> over time. Um, but yes, it, they actually invented a prize while I was there called the, Asp the, Op the Aspen Glimmerglass Prize. And the prize was you got to go to Glimmerglass Opera Summer Festival and be an assistant there. And then I came back a couple years later and was the assistant conductor for the festival. Um, yeah, then I went and worked with Levine at Tanglewood. And what Levine 
the game. I mean, for for all of for all of his many sins and problems, he was mm. a, a, quite an extraordinary teacher. Probably the greatest teacher I've ever encountered. What he understood was, and it, uh, Alan Gilbert was is quite a bit like this too, is understanding the psychology of how people learn. Mm. You know, he had no patience, and this is interesting. He's I never heard a negative word come out of his mouth, James Levine. He actually built a structure around him where he never had to speak a single negative word to anyone, which right. is its own kind of <laughs> psychosis. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he had no patience for a musician showing up thinking that their job was to just be a blank page on which the conductor was to write. Mm. You know, um, I remember once we were, I was assisting him on Meistersinger. And he was rehearsing in the morning. And he had this amazing ability to know like 45 minutes in advance when people would start to get tired, like right. long before it affected their playing. He just yeah. had this extra muscle in his brain that allowed him to, to experience it. And he just stopped about 45 minutes before the end of the morning rehearsal and just talked to them about the urgency of showing up with ideas Yes. That then the conductor can fold into the texture of the music making like a mousse, you know, mm. like a chocolate mm. mousse that, that you have to you have to give them something to to work with. You have to come in with ideas and um, and to expect that as a conductor of an orchestra. Yes, very much. And so. and it was amazing. And then he let everyone go early. <laughs> and then we all went to lunch. Everyone walked out thinking, oh, God, he hates us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he never said a single negative thing. And then we came back from lunch and the orchestra manager came out to me and said, uh, Maestro Levine would like you to start the act three prelude of Meister Singer. I was like, okay. So I got up there and I gave the downbeat and it was the first time I had ever experienced a truly empowered orchestra yeah. where I realized I had to do nothing yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, except wiggle my eyebrow and things would happen. Yeah. And we got through it and it was wonderful. And, you know, the orchestra was very sweet and grabbed their bows and did all the nice things. And then Levine was there and he said, okay. And then he got up on the podium and he said, let's do the prelude again. And what was so beautiful about that moment was he knew that if he came back after the lunch, he would start from exactly the same places where he left off. Mm. But he put me in as a kind of palate cleanser. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. they could try out what they had been thinking about over lunch. And then he could step up and, and add to it. And, and he said to me once, he said, I'm not interested in taking okay things and making them good. I'm only interested in taking good things and making them great. Yes. And, yeah. you know, that is a very opera conductor's mentality because you, know, you do nine Otellos, you know, there might be disastrous things that happen every night that you have no control over. But if, if one or two extraordinary things happen in the evening, that's, that's that's what it's about. Mazel was really interesting. Um, I was the first apprentice conductor in his festival, his foundation that he ran at his farm in um, in Virginia. And I went down there. It was the first year that they had, were doing it. And he had just built this theater. Uh, <laughs> I remember they built this theater. <laughs> and... It, you walk down into the pit from the audience. There's like mm. these stairs that kind of went along the back of the pit and they built it at exactly the wrong height so that if he stood where he was supposed to stand, he could, if he looked up even a little bit, he couldn't see the orchestra. And if he looked down even a little bit, he couldn't see the stage. <laughs> and it was just a nightmare. Um, <laughs> but he was very generous. He had, an, he had a very fascinating mind. You know, there was a little Hannibal Lecter quality to him where it was kind of like, <laughs> I don't really want to know all the things that are going on behind <laughs> those eyes. Um, huh. But, you know, we had an amazing, I remember one session we had, we did a score session on Mahler 1. And he said, he said, he gave me such a great piece of advice. He said that, let yourself off the hook for not being able to hear everything all the time. I remember that on the page was some, one of those insanely counterpuntal sections, yeah. you know, or like, you know, or like, bits of Heldenleben or something where so much is happening. Yes. How can you process it? He said, let yourself off the hook, but learn how to look at a score and say, no matter what I'm listening to, some part of my ear will always hear this line. Mm. 
So yes. I don't need to put my attention on it. Figure out where to put your ear deliberately and stay there. Mm. And that was such a great refocusing moment for me um, of a way of approaching a, a, a score, of figuring out where does my ear need to be actively engaged with and where can I trust that I will be taking in information, even if it is, as you said, kind of in the periphery yeah. of, of my awareness. That's such and so brilliant advice. Brilliant advice, because yeah. that's what we do, especially in rehearsal, when you know I, I tend to find my eyes are much more firmly fixed on the score because you're looking for problems, you're, you know, you're trying to hear what's causing issues. And to how to be able to, as you say, you 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 listen intently to one line, but there are always like there's there's always a line going on that you, you're just always aware of, you know, whether it be yeah. the trumpet with a melody, or the first violins with a melody, or the flute, or the or a bass line, you know. But to 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 be really focused in on something and stick with it, I think that's brilliant advice, absolutely brilliant. Well, and advice. it's and it's the problem. I mean, I think there are a lot of benefits to to listening to recordings. Um, I'm not someone who thinks that it's uh, always a terrible idea. The risk, of course, is that you end up with a kind of Frankenstein version of your performance, which is cobbled together from a million ideas that you don't maybe understand the impetus behind. But the, the biggest problem with recordings is that it teaches you to listen very superficially. It decides for you what's important yeah, on, on a yeah. certain level. And you're not even aware that you're being influenced in that way. And so spending time with the score, analyzing it from that angle, from the angle of what is buried, and you end up, you know, excavating details and lines and things that you suddenly, you know, your heart becomes so attached to them and you desperately want to hear them. And, mm. and, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're not just rebalancing things for, for some intellectual reason it's because you know you just adore and want to hear this small detail in the middle of a Mahler symphony and then people will hopefully respond to you with that energy you know uh, I'm going to go on to talk about you know uh a particular, you know, rubbish. Cut that out, Mike. That was a shit sentence. Um, <laughs> God, wouldn't that be great to do in rehearsal? Oh, no, yeah, just exactly. To, to say, guys, can we just trash that last five minutes of me rambling about sunsets? That would be great. Thanks, thanks. Put in the bin. Yeah, absolutely true. Um, no, what I was going to say was a typical year for you, you know, what going right the way back to the beginning and sitting in the wings and on a chair as a toddler, listening to your mum sing. Opera has obviously been a big thing and still it's a big thing. But you're also music director of a, of a small ensemble in Ireland called Crash, the Crash Ensemble, which means that you're also very much into contemporary music and you guest conduct in other places, in verted commas, normal places, not just contemporary music. So, <laughs> yeah. in nothing, a, in about, a, nothing about yeah. Italy is normal, by the no, way. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but in, a, in an ideal uh, world for you, how would a season be structured? How many opera productions would you like to do? Mm -hmm. How many visits are you contractually obliged to go back to, to work in Ireland with Crash? And then, you know, um, as many guests, I suppose, as possible. But you'll have relationships that already formed with orchestras that you go back to every year. So how, do, how would a year look for you? Well, there's the question of what it looks like now and what I would like it to look like. Um, well, I mean, we're, all, we're all in that boat, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, when I decided to be, when I decided to pursue this career very seriously, I, I was living in New York. I I had a very American definition of what a music directorship was in my head. Mm. You know, I grew up in St. Louis with, with Leonard Slacken, who was... It's not it's not the celebrity part of it at all. It's the 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 educational evangelist po yeah. politician um, figurehead cultural yeah. cultural yeah. leader yes. uh, image that I had in my head. And so one of the things I said to myself was, whenever I show up to have responsibility for um, for a community and an ensemble, I want to be able to program what they need which means mm. i need to have the deepest bench that i can and and i think i'm a little different than a lot of my colleagues i'm not a kind of i'm not really an alpha type uh i never have been I, i'm a very collaborative person i've always worked best in groups and i'm not someone who became a conductor because 
you know, I want to record my Brahm cycle with Deutsche Grammophone. Like I just couldn't yeah. care less about that. If I'm working with an ensemble and we develop a relationship with repertoire that I feel is is worth capturing, great. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that would take a while to get to. I want to kind of, I my, my dream as a 20 year old was to be this kind of Swiss army knife for whatever the community and the ensemble needed. So when I was, a, right after I got at Juilliard, my first job was music director of the New York Youth Symphony, which was an amazing job. I mean, uh, Ming-Wen Chung had been music director there, Leonard Slacken had been music director there. It had this august kind of uh, group of people running it. And and the best thing about it was that the upper age limit of that youth orchestra was, I don't know, 22. So yeah. it was a lot of kids from Juilliard and Manhattan School who were playing like seventh horn on Heldenleben in their school. And they could come here and play first on Mahler 5 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And it was the best education because you know, we would spend 12 weeks doing major repertoire and solving every problem. And we did Daphnis, we did Heldenleben, we did Rite of Spring, we did Mahler 5. I mean, it was an amazing thing at Carnegie Hall. But at the same time, I was also assistant conductor of New York City Opera in its last few years that it was there. And I was also working as assistant conductor of the New York City Ballet yeah. um, for about two years. And so I was running around from all of these places and I absolutely loved it. I loved that every day I got to put on a different hat and tell stories in a different way and be needed by those musicians in different ways. Yeah. You know, the needs of the New York City Ballet Orchestra were completely different than the needs of the New York Youth Symphony or, you know, um, my new music friends with their ensembles in New York, you know, and I, I, I never was interested in contemporary music when I was a kid. You know, I mean, I had to go to college before someone introduced me to Steve Reich and you know, uh, uh, Webern. Um, yeah. Not that Webern is contemporary music by any stretch of the imagination, but I mean, I, you know, I didn't know who Morton Feldman was. Um, and then I got to Juilliard and I will answer your question eventually, I promise. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but uh, what, what's interesting about it so far is that you're striking a chord with me in the fact that it sounds like we're, we very much sing off the same hymn sheet where basically... I you know I don't want to be you know, my question was how many operas do you want to do because your CV has a lot of opera on it and you and you're MD of a, of a contemporary music group, but actually it sounds like you were like me, you know uh, the next thing I conduct is some schools concerts, but I've been putting together film music programs for another orchestra. I've been putting together a Bollywood program for another orchestra, and the yeah. last major symphony I conducted was Shostakovich eight. Um, yeah. and I've got the oh god, are you okay? Me. No, I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm absolutely How fine. It? Yeah. it went really well. But um, the, next, the next big place program I do has got La Valse and the Right to Spring in it. Point being is that, to me, I, I love my job regardless of what's in front of me, and I and I will put 100% into every project that I do, but I don't want to be pigeonholed into being the person who does just that and just that. Do you know what I mean? It sounds like that's what, what, you're, what you're saying. I, I mean, a, a life of variety feels like a very full life to me. Yes. And I'm, I'm exactly yeah. the same way. I I rarely say no to things if I think any part of the project is interesting or I'm yeah. going to learn something from it. Um, and also, I just like, you know, being able to integrate new skills. You know, I, I absolutely adore that. And I didn't do the normal kind of assistant, American assistant conductor thing. I didn't go to, you know, a, a regional orchestra and be their assistant and do the family concerts and the pops concerts. And so I'm actually kind of able to, when I do fun concerts or film score concerts or something like that, I I get to approach it with a kind of joy and maturity yeah. that I think that a lot of, um, you know, these poor assistants who are 23 and are only working with the orchestra when the orchestra is doing concerts they really don't wish to be doing. Yeah. Um, or, or you know, not feeling like they have enough time to to properly realize them, um, you know. I, 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 I love this variety. I would say that I've, I've had so much variety in my life that at this age, building something with people that I really care about, and respect, is becoming the priority. Feeling yes. like it's not about legacy; it's just about feeling like, you know, as a guest conductor. Even if you come back to the same orchestra every year, every two years, there is a certain ephemeral quality to it. You get airdropped in. Maybe the audience remembers you. Maybe they don't. Maybe the orchestra remembers you. Maybe they don't. You do the concert. Hopefully it goes well. And then probably two weeks later, everybody's forgotten about it. Um, you know, who knows how much this sticks with you. But also the other end is you never know whose life has been transformed, who's never come yeah. to a concert before. Ooh. 
Um, but it, it's there's no you're not on the ground to discover one way or the other what the impact of your presence has been. Mm. And I think as I get older, I want to feel like I can enact that. And it's part of the reason I took the job with Crash. So Crash is Ireland's dominant contemporary music ensemble. And I was match made with them by what is now Irish National Opera um, several years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, mm. to premiere Donica Dennehy's opera, The Second Violinist, which he wrote with Enda Walsh. And we toured it all over. We took it to the Barbican. We took it to Amsterdam. Um, we toured all around Ireland. And it was it was the single happiest working experience of my life. It was one of those projects, you know, that just kind of uses all of your idiosyncratic tools and 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 uh, aesthetics and and loves was very dark opera um with fabulous people and the ensemble was crash ensemble and we just got on like mm. a house on fire and when they asked me to be the principal conductor i you know i had to think about it. you said pigeonholed before like you i did think to myself like will having the only titled position on my cv be running a contemporary music ensemble keep me from people hiring me to do bohem you know yes, and yeah. maybe it has but at that point i thought i just want to work with the people who love working the way that i do yeah who want to to want to discover things and have fun and especially after years of of trying to figure out how to be a leader how to be an authority in a room it was a space where i could come and really just be one of a gang of people and that isn't always possible in in our profession but to just feel like you were with colleagues making something together in the most democratic open joyful way and i thought i want if i am going to dedicate myself to something four or five times a year i want it to be with the people who who rejuvenate me in, yeah. in this way and i just adore them i mean i just love them and um you know i kate ellis is the artistic director she makes most of the repertoire and programming decisions but she and i work together on figuring that out and um and it's it's just a constant joy to to be there and um it's part why i was in glasgow's because john yeah. harris you know uh, who runs red note ensemble runs new music dublin and saw me work and then when they were doing ligeti piano concerto he said why don't you come over and do this and it's opened up a lot of doors for me i love it um but yes i think that whether it's in an opera house, whether it's in a big orchestra, whether it's in an ensemble, the chance to build something together with people over time is 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 what I most kind of uh, crave and am satisfied by. I'm in the same position, and I hope to one day be be in a position where I can, you know, do that. Uh, I'm, <laughs> let's I'm, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, you know, because you're a regular listener, that there is an eleventh question, a hidden eleventh question, <laughs> uh, and. You know whether we're looking at a contemporary score or an opera that you haven't yet have you you've yet conducted. How do you go about learning your scores? Are you somebody who still sits down at the piano and oodles their way through it and looks at the odd chord, especially with contemporary music, maybe to pick out the melody if we can't hear it with our inner ear? Are you somebody who goes from big to small or from page one to page nine hundred? And as you well know, are you a scribbler, Ryan? Are you a red, blue, <laughs> black, or are you a keep it virginally white? What's your process? It's changed. I mean, obviously it's changed so much, but it has profoundly changed actually since the pandemic. Right. The pandemic changed the way I had so, so much more time to study the scores I was preparing during the pandemic. It's one of the things that I remember Alan Gilbert told me when I was really young. It was like, learn all your scores now because you never have time when you're mm. in a different place every other week. I suddenly had time. And I remember the first concert I had coming back from the pandemic was my first ever Mozart Jupiter. Right. Uh, in Italy with a very good chamber orchestra. And I said, you know what? For the first time in my life, I'm going to sit down and make my own parts. I've never done, I learned how to do it, but I'd never done it before. And I actually ended up, I didn't end up actually sending the parts to them, but right. I sat down and did the work of just taking one part after another, sitting down at the piano just with that part and singing it, solfeging it, playing it, um, living like method acting, like living, yeah. trying to imagine the life of the person who's just staring at those pages. And that was the most transformative thing. As soon as I did that, I never wanted to go back. Um, 
I mean, obviously, like we all have scores from our 20s that, uh, you know, look like uh, uh, Pollock's, Jason yeah. and Pollock paintings. And, uh, you know, I think I used to use like green highlighter for things. God, I mean, you know, the horrifying things. Um, I am a red, blue and black person. Um, Me too. Orchestral cues, or, orchestral cues are always red. Soloist cues are always blue. But 90% of my score is written is filled with notes to myself that I write on the plane on the way home from the concert. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. been the that has been the best discipline for me is like getting on that plane, being tired, wanting to just do nothing but like immerse myself in some book or TV show. And instead pulling out the score, going page by page and just writing down everything I learned, everything mm -hmm. I had to fix, everything I discovered worked or didn't work. So that the next time I come back to it in, you know, two months Whenever, or 20 yeah. years, it, the, the, whatever I learned is there. And I have always regretted not doing that when I've come back to a score. Um, and so now most of my scores are just me just with tons of handwriting scribbling in the side that is probably mostly illegible, even to me. Um, <laughs> I will tell you it's such a cheeky story about markings. I was assisting a, an opera conductor when I was about 22 at Aspen and he was the guy who was conducting this. I will not mention names. No, no, no. The guy who was conducting the opera was not an opera conductor. He was an, only right. a symphonic conductor. He had never really done much opera. And he was not giving any cues to the stage. And I mean, just not, wow. and it was a new, it was a new opera. So yeah. everyone needed help and they weren't getting much. And I remember the director finding me in a hallway and like essentially throwing me up against the wall and saying, you got to tell your boss to throw more cues to that <laughs> stage. And I was like, I'm not going to, I'm 23. Uh. He's going to crush me under his boot. Um, but during a break, I went up to his score and I noticed that all of the vocal cues for the stage he had written in blue and his blue pencil was just there on the score, on the stand next to it. Yeah. And so I just added a couple. <laughs> I, not many, like four yeah. or five that I thought were important. Yeah. And he gave all of them. He never noticed. And then years later, I saw him. I assisted him at the New York Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. And I told him that story. And he punched me so hard in the arm that he <laughs> left a bruise. And then he said, thank you for doing that. I didn't really know how to handle myself. And then he invited me to work with his orchestra. So it was all okay. Good. But I think about the unbelievable arrogance that that, <laughs> that, that took at that time. Oh, I just want to crawl into a hole. But yeah, I think um, for the piano thing, um, the, when there's something really naughty or mm. I really want to hear the interplay, I'll sit down at the piano and I'll I'll get it in my ears. Um, but most of the work I do is just by myself. So again, you know, I don't want the piano to make decisions for me or to 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 thin out the way that I approach a score you know yes. I want to I want to take everything as holistically as possible because orchestras are democracies and you have to know every every in the middle of every bar suddenly someone else is the leader and everyone has to suddenly adjust to working and accompanying and supporting them you know I mean I remember Alan Gilbert one of the great things he taught me was that he said he thought of conducting like trying to move a giant beach ball mm -hmm. that if you just kind of touch it at the right spot then the whole thing moves as one yes. and it's just about knowing in any given moment okay i want to move this i want to slow this down who do i go to that will have this cascading effect um on everybody else and I'd, so i you know the only way to do that is to try to know everything so if i get a chance to sit down and just with every part and just go part by part and build it up in my head then i feel you know that i might be 10 percent ready to to take to take on whatever's in in front of me are you a young conductor thirsty for knowledge and wanting to discover more about the world of conducting then my patreon page is there for you i'm constantly posting new content there based on my experiences as a conductor and an ex-orchestra player and i offer you the chance to ask me any question any time of the day it may interest you to know that about a third of my subscribers are either studying conducting or are at the start of a conducting career. When you subscribe, you will gain access to interviews, video posts, tour diaries, articles and much more. If you pay for the whole year, then you'll gain a 10% discount and if you're a student, contact me directly and there'll be a further discount. 
All of this can be found at patreon.com forward slash a mic on the podium. And from just £5 a month, you can gain access to this ever-growing resource on conductors and conducting. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com. Details and links to the page are in the show notes attached to this episode. Now, the all-important 10 questions with my guest, Ryan McAdams. Ryan, as I said, you are a regular listener, so you know what's coming now. It's the 10 questions, and you all will also know that I start with what sound or noise do you love and what sound or noise do you hate? I mean, I just feel like everyone gives this answer, but it's the truth, which is the, my son laughing. While, especially while my wife reads him a book, yeah, you know, that kind of, that just, that belly laughter that is uncontainable. Um, from a four-year-old suddenly yeah. finding some inane little detail in a story hysterically funny that it, that's it, that's my favorite sound um I also I live in Brighton and the the beach outside my window is you know it's a rocky beach yes and there is a sound I'm sure you're familiar with it being in this for coming from this country of the water receding over the rocks through the, and the through rocks the pebbles. Yeah, yeah. through yeah. the pebbles and the pebbles mm. kind of moving with the water mm. back towards the sea that feels like that's such a brain massage that really scrapes the plaque off my brain yeah pretty 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 effectively yeah that, that, um, that's a lovely sound and also that the your child laughing i vividly i can hear it now my my eldest daughter is going to be 25 this year but we were in a pub in galway in ireland and she was <laughs> it's about 18 months two years old and she was laughing so loudly that most of the pub came round the corner to see who it was, to see this little girl laughing her head off. Yeah, and everybody was smiling. They just thought it was, you know, utterly brilliant that this kid was just laughing her head off. And it is a wonderful sound. And it's not an often given answer. Um, oh, good. Yeah, that... Piv- pivoting yeah. towards joy. Just yeah, always exactly. feels like the right, <laughs> the right answer. How do I bottle this and and drink it every day? And a sound you dislike or even hate muttering yes uh, people muttering I, I i it maybe it strikes a kind of insecure place in me but when people mutter something that i can tell they don't want me to hear i i it doesn't happen often but it there's a part of my brain that says oh i haven't built enough trust with them mm. i have failed in building trust with them where they feel like they can't be direct about something that they're thinking or have a question about. And so whenever I hear someone muttering, I, it's probably very embarrassing and the last thing they want, but I go right to them mm. and I say, how can I help? You yeah. know, what, 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 what question can I answer? And often they'll be so startled um, by that American arrogant directness um, that they'll actually tell me what they're thinking and yeah. then we'll solve the problem together. And then hopefully you have a, you have a buddy, but yeah, I think I tell my son, you owe people uh i don't know where i came up with this mantra but kindness clarity and curiosity yeah. Yeah. um and you know it, clarity is something that's really important to me and if there isn't a, a two-way dialogue between me and anyone not just musicians or singers or whoever um you know i feel like my job is to make people feel so safe that they can be whoever they want to be in that moment and you know, I, I'll be so delighted to <laughs> experience it. And if I haven't created that atmosphere, then I, I failed on some level. Number three is if you had 24 hours free, what would you spend it doing? Um, I would start the day with a walk in the woods with my wife and son. Um, my wife is a astonishing artist, a, a dance theater artist. And there is just no one in the world I like talking to more or... Mm collaborating with and watching her in the woods with my son open his perception up to nature and be as she would say embodied Mm -hmm. in the natural world you know especially the way my son will get after walking for 45 50 minutes where everything is his he's entirely external you know he's just he's just receiving from everything around him um, watching them do that and w- taking a walk in nature, that would be how I would start the day. The afternoon would just be sitting on a couch with a cup of coffee or tea and reading a book mm. and just having some some private mental space to um, go into another world or learn something. Right now I'm going through 
um, Robert Caro's immense book, the the Power Broker, which is his story, um, of um, of of Robert Moses who transformed New York City, and I think it's like twelve hundred pages long. And yeah. even if I just take down five pages a day, I'm such a happier person. Um, and then at night, I would host a dinner party. Yeah, I would I would have friends over. I would share whatever wine and cheese and baking recipes I picked up on travels and and just share whatever I have been so lucky to 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 grab as I as we go through the world um if you don't get to share it with people then it's it's I, I find it pretty useless um yeah. and pretty meaningless so I pick up things on my travels I bring them home so that I can share them with with the people that I really love and then just hopefully just sit there quietly and listen to them be brilliant and laugh with them that seems like the best day for me Sounds like a lovely day. Uh, I think it's the, I, this is the first time I've admitted this, and this is by no way a means of a plug. But on Patreon, I interview other people who have experiences with conducting, and one of the standard 10 questions on the Patreon episodes on those interviews is, which three musicians would you like to spend a, a, have around for a dinner party? Uh, and because I know that the answer is always so different. Um, and it almost was one of the questions for this podcast way back in mm -hmm. 2020 during the pandemic. But I came up with the number 10 as it is because I wanted to to hear actually about your food and wine choices. Because I think that's more personal <laughs> than just thinking of three interesting people you want to eat with. Um, but I think, you know, that that social discourse is... I mean, it's it's also one of the perks of the job if, if I'm sure like you do, you go back to a place for a second and third and fourth time that you oh, might yeah. end up going out for dinner with a friend that you've made there or who lives there. or, or uh, And it, it, it is one of the joys. Whenever I go back to Buenos Aires, I know I never have an evening off because I've got so many friends down there. You know, <laughs> it, it's wonderful. Um, it's, it, you know, when I was a young and insecure and anxious conductor, which was quite crippling for me for a long time, I developed a lot of very self-destructive habits trying to to cope with the the difficulty of the job and the loneliness of the job and the lack of feedback um, mm. that you get as a young conductor. Um, I would often go to places, fabulous places and never see them because I would just sit in the hotel and study or be totally shut down. Um, and now the greatest joy of feeling like, you know, it's not going to be a disaster most times yeah. is feeling like when the rehearsal's over, I can afford myself the joy of actually going out into the world and experiencing what they have and, and meeting friends. And it's just, it's essential because the job is, as you know, so lonely and so isolating. Mm. Um, and so often uh, without um, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, feedback and, and, and mirror that you hope that you can get. Um, it's, 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 it's such a necessity, by the way, very short detour. The number one musician I would have at a dinner party would be Wynton Marsalis mm. because he said the single greatest thing to me, I think that I've ever heard about being an artist, which is, he said this at the Juilliard commencement at my commencement when I graduated, he said, if you have a job that for you is not a job, don't let someone else for whom it is a job convince you that it's a job. <laughs> that's very good yeah. and i think about i think yeah. about it all the time and i realize every time i start to think of this job as a job um or i start to you know think about oh i'm going back to the grindstone like there's just that winton's voice comes up in my head and says no 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 you're the luckiest human being alive and you get to do what you love and you're learning and your journey with this will never end so just stay in your yeah. gratitude and absolutely like, suck I'd it up slip and, back yeah, into it immediately. Yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> suck it up. Suck it up is would have been a lot <laughs> would have been a lot more terse from him at the Juilliard be. graduation. But <laughs> yeah, not quite the, what you would expect from the major speaker at anybody's graduation, but still. No, um, especially not a jazz improviser. No, exactly. <laughs> for whom for whom brevity is is not the soul of wit, shall we say? <laughs> That's very true. Uh, you know that number four is who would be your favorite conductor or conductors of yesteryear? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be another person who just comes on and says Kleiber, you know, or 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 Karyan. I mean, I think we all know these people. I am I get fascinated with conductors who long before it became as homogenized an art form as it kind of is who just seemed to like have never encountered any other conductors and just made it up as they went along. It seems. Yes. Um, but I would say that I, you know, there's that old adage of like, what's your favorite score? Oh, the one I'm conducting right now. Yeah. But yeah, I do, yeah. I do go through phases of discovering conductors who for some reason 
didn't come into my my sphere of experience when I was younger. And so I go through these periods of, of now at this age rediscovering the artistry of conductors who I I just didn't appreciate or didn't focus on deliberately. Mm. Um, the last year I went through just an enormous Charles McCarris phase. Yes. Where I absolutely poured over everything he made and was just staggered by the level of, of artistry. I mean, I was doing Faust, uh, Gounod's Faust in Zurich. And I, you know, obviously once I, once I finish learning a score to the extent that I feel like I know, I listen to everything I can get my hands on just to see how do they answer those questions? Do they even know that those questions are there to be answered? You know, yes. what questions have I not considered? And I loved, there's so many great recordings, but when I came upon Macaris's recording of Faust from the Opera de Paris, I was, I, I mean, I couldn't breathe mm. the whole time I was watching it. It is of such dramatic intelligence. Um, I'm, I'm still staggered by it. But Macaris is someone I'm absolutely fascinated with. You know, someone like uh, Georges Prêtre, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I don't even I don't even understand how any of that works. No, no, exactly. But <laughs> how God he, did it. How does he, he do? Uh, how uh, how did he do bolero like that? How does he get that kind of rhythmic freedom without ever sacrificing um, the under the rhythmic undercurrent of that music? I'm just yeah. I'm absolutely fascinated with those people who seem to just live in a slightly different dimension. But yeah, I think at the moment it's it's the people I'm fascinated with. Um, yeah. And I mean, obviously, you know, Bernstein, every American young conductor was obsessed with Bernstein. It's interesting now going back and I have some questions about, obviously he was an extraordinary human being. Was he always a great capital G great conductor? I, I, I don't know, but, mm. but the, 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 the figurehead that I inherited from him, you know, the, the, the bust yeah. <laughs> that's in the, that's in the, yeah, uh, yeah, that's in the concert hall of him is so deeply lodged in my brain as what a conductor can be and the effect they can have on the community around them. I think how you affect your community, how you use the orchestra to to deepen the soul of a community, the, you know, I think Bernstein figured that out before everybody else and yeah. did it pretty brilliantly. Well, interesting choices. Uh, Macaris, not sure he's been chosen before. Pretra, maybe once or twice. And uh, and as you said, young American doctors, virtually all of them have said Bernstein. I wonder whether it's, it's unavoidable. <laughs> well, of course it is. I wonder whether you're going to choose a figurehead or maybe a, a couple of complete mavericks. There's the answer to question five, <laughs> which who would be your favorite current conductors? Not that there are many mavericks around these days. I mean, um, there are a few. There are a few. You know, but, you know. I mean, obviously, there are great artists everywhere. Um, and it would be I think it'd be a little facile to to talk about, you know, the people who run the big orchestras, because of course they're extraordinary. There are conductors who I think, I want to know what they have to say about yeah. this music. Um, Pavel Yarvi is someone who I always think, I want to know what he thinks about this piece. Yeah, Tony Papano is yes. one of them. Um, you know, I remember when I was doing Brahms for Serenade, it was one of my favorite pieces of music. I listened to, I think every recording that has ever existed. And I finally found one that Papano made with Santa Cecilia that was on like a radio broadcast somewhere. I found it in the depths of the internet. Hmm. And it's the only one I've ever thought, yeah, that's the right tempo for the Adagio. You know, <laughs> like, right. like yeah. that's, I thought I, he's fascinating to me. Um, but maybe I'll take the second just to point a spotlight on people who I think are doing the work of changing the role of the orchestra in a community in really profound ways. It's a very American idea, I know. Um, but I think David Robertson's tenure in St. Louis hopefully will be studied in some in some way. Um, he was such a jack of all trades there, but he, in, he involved, he not only was tremendously fun. I mean, this is somebody who can, who can do all of, you got trouble from Music Man off the top of his head in front of an orchestra, but also, can can lecture for hours on end about uh, about Kierkegaard. Um, you know, he really put the orchestra in the intellectual center of a community and it, it made it an intellectually relevant organization mm. and also won Grammys and also lifted them up from a very dark time in their in their history. Um, you know, he kind of did everything that was needed and so much more. And he he programmed things in venues all around St. Louis 
that felt like they belonged specifically in those size venues, not just it, they weren't just advertisements for the big show at the concert hall. They would yes. say they said we are going to bring these pieces that can that should exist down the road from you in the small little church basement. Yeah. This is the way it should be performed. Come, this is part of our ethos is to 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 leave the concert hall and bring this extraordinary very varied repertoire out. Um, I would also look at um, Teddy Abrams in Louisville. I don't know if you've had Teddy on your no. podcast. No. Please have him on. He's such a good chat. And he's uh, a brilliant guy. And what he's done in Louisville is is pretty remarkable. Um, he, he, the way in which he just immediately turned that orchestra and put it right at the center of the soul of a community. Also, um, this is really important to me. Um, Yvonne Fisher in terms of thinking about how to use an orchestra to promote the artistic lives and satisfaction of players. Yes. Yeah. Why? Go, when I read that he went every season or does go every season to a different handful of musicians and says, you know, can you help curate a week with me? What do you want to play? What are your passions? What do you want to perform? What do you want to lecture about? Let's yeah. build a week around you and let's do it together. Why can't orchestras be a venue for allowing this festival of, of, of talent to express themselves? I mean, I grew up in, in St. Louis where we had the, the, a great baseball team. We had a great football team. Eventually we had a great hockey team. And every time anyone would come out to warm up, you know, in the batter's box, everyone in the stands knew who that person was, who they were married to, what their <laughs> yeah. stats were, yeah. you know, how many yeah. RBIs. And I know so many season ticket holders to symphony orchestras who couldn't possibly name the assistant principal cello, maybe mm. not even the principal cello. You yeah. know, why are we not using this as a venue to develop intimate relationships between specific players and the community in ways that allow everyone to feel nurtured and supported? So Ivan Fisher doing that work in Budapest was a big inspiration for me. Brilliant choices, and also brilliant. I, I agree with you about you know. I, I, of course, there are other orchestras in Birmingham here, but the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra is, is the the major orchestra here. I I do feel that some of the audience know who the principal cellist is, but that's mainly because he's been there thirty years. But there's not yeah. enough of right. there's not enough of that. Um, right. Definitely not. I know going way back to the beginning, Ed Gardner was just about to start as the as the music director of the London Philharmonic, and he had. You know, he was talking then about trying to get the the LPO, you know, out into the community more, even though it's London and there are already hundreds of you know loads of orchestras already, and where which bit of the community? But, yeah. but yeah, I think you're so right. You know, it it's being going back to what you said. It's caring for the people you're with, enjoying the people you're conducting, and where they are, and trying to make their existence relevant to the people around them where they live. You know, that's an yeah. important and, thing. And rather than just and, flying in, taking their money and buggering off back home again. <laughs> well, and which, empowering them every chance you get. I mean, I feel like yeah. the job of a conductor is to empower people to be their full, reckless, thoughtful, brilliant selves. I mean, it's, you know, obviously if I go and conduct, I don't know, Rachmaninoff Second Symphony, I want to hear what that clarinet has to think yeah. about that solo so that I can fold it into the texture of what's happening around. I want these concerts to be this this amalgam of the collective experience on the stage and i in my experience you can walk into it, any orchestra and ask any person you know who, what is your idiosyncratic love for what composer do you want to focus on and i promise you a hundred times out of a hundred you are going to get a story that you're going to want mm. to chew on for the rest of your life and they are people are ex they are explosions of interest and curiosity and idiosyncrasy that would so endear audience members to them if they were given a, a stage and it only deepens the sense of of i mean i don't even know in st louis if they felt like those people in the orchestra lived in st louis and yeah. were part of the community yeah. you know maybe they thought they were beamed in from another planet or something but yeah yeah i think it's i think it's really vital anyway sorry let's no, carry on I, oh absolutely no, I, no we could talk about all of that for days and days oh. But Forever. we won't. We're going to go on to number six. Please. Number six is, what is the hardest work you've ever conducted? I mean, there are those pieces you do that make you feel like you've leveled up 
a bit, you know, yeah. first time I did Rite of Spring, first time I did Mahler 5, you know, you kind of get to the other end. I mean, I had a, my, my first ever conducting teacher in Indiana said, the first time you do a piece, you haven't done it, yes. <laughs> which I think is pretty accurate. But you get to the end and you think, OK, I'm I'm capable of getting from beginning to end and empowering people along the way. Um, I think the hardest thing I've ever done overall was the second opera that I did with Crash Ensemble and Donna Kadanihi, which was an opera called The First Child. Um, it was very soon after my own son was born. My first child had been born. The uh, spoiler alert: the opera does not end well for the first child. <laughs> right, um, the, exactly. I, the, this, this, <laughs> oh the sea, the sea comes and takes this child, and I was literally learning the score while staring out at the sea outside yeah. my window with my child playing at my feet. Um, it was also a very difficult time personally for me. I was approaching 40 and all the collective <laughs> trauma and soul searching that comes from hitting middle age. Um, we had just moved, you know, it was, po it was just on the end of the pandemic. Um, I was reconsidering everything that I was doing with my life and who I wanted to be in the world and what I considered to be success and what I considered to be valuable time. And that show was so emotionally draining for me. It was it was difficult technically, mm. but it was so emotionally wrenching. And every day I had to go in and I couldn't help but, you know, consider the passing of my own child every time I conducted it. And I'm it's, sure. it's, it's, the, it's the only thing I've ever conducted where every day, as soon as the show was over, I just went home. Yeah. Like I couldn't go out and play and go to the pub with yeah. my friends. I was so worn out. And I would call my wife at home and say, I'm so bad tempered in rehearsal. I feel <laughs> like such is something wrong with me. And she said, Ryan, it's, it's the show. Yeah. The show is affecting you. Um, we recorded it. It's an amazing show. I hope it gets performed more often. It's brilliant, but it, it, it took me out of it. And I will say the other answer to this is right now I'm making my own parts for cozy. Right. And first of all, making your own parts for a Mozart opera is like, <laughs> you know, it's like it's like taking a butterfly and sticking a pin through it, but still trying to <laughs> trying to keep that color and light and, and flutter into it. You know, you're so worried about damaging it. Um, but cozy, man. I remember when I, I assisted Alan Gilbert on it. And at one point he said every single thing in this opera is almost subdivided, but not. Oh, it's one of those, it's, right? Oh, oh it's no, no. So it is oh, so uh, hard yeah. to stay in this liminal space um, of control, but you have to. It's mm. it's easy to shift it from one side to the other, but staying in this liminal question, this big question mark space, is so important. Um, but I'm doing it again this summer, and oh, the 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 responsibility of it is so immense, and yeah. it's it's thrilling. So at the moment, yeah. Also, I did a Shostakovich five two weeks after my son was born. That was so terrible <laughs> because I hadn't <laughs> slept in two weeks. Yeah. I was waking up every 45 minutes wondering where my son was in the bed and realizing yeah. that he was home, you know, a, a, a two countries away. Um, I, I don't even know how we all made it through that. I don't know why I thought it, advice to any young conductor out there when you're about to have a child whether it's you or anyone else please if you have the financial capacity take the month before the child comes off take the two or three months after the child comes off yeah. because you will you will not do quality work in that time <laughs> <laughs> i i think i can uh wholly agree with that for those for those who don't know what sub uh you're almost on the verge of subdividing all the time means dear listener if you're beating in four in a bar it means that the tempo is slow enough that you would desperately want to go into eight. The nearest I can equate to doing it is you're riding your bicycle so slowly that you th feel you're about to fall over. So the best thing to do is to put some stabilizers on. The problem ah. is when you put the stabilizers on, it's almost impossible to take them off. Once you've gone from four to eight, it's almost impossible to go back to four again. Correct. Um, can I tell you? Can I tell yeah. you? Something? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you a great story. My wife, who's a dancer, is a Baroque movement specialist. Right. And I once asked her what her definition as a dancer of adagio was. Right. And she said, oh, it's the moment I become aware of the small muscles. 
instead of the big ones. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, yeah. yes, <laughs> yeah. in the gesture, I'm aware of all the small muscles working instead of just the big muscles making it's the gesture. Absolutely and true. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is exactly yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is just what subdividing is. So any piece that we're, when you're on the verge of going from, you know, from one into three or from four into eight or from you know yeah. six into 12 the minute you go to that that bigger number it's almost impossible to come back and it more often than not will slow down uh even i remember further, you know um it, it's so it, dangerous what a, one of the great joys of living in new york was you got to i got to go into the new york philharmonic archives all the time and you can see bernstein's hand now they put it all online yes. you can see bernstein's handwritten scores and the his the last page of his Mahler nine he wrote have the courage to remain in eight. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh, that's that. a brilliant sentence. All, yeah. I mean, obviously he's 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 writing because he knows people will read it later. Um, but he's but of course I understand exactly what he means. <laughs> Absolutely true. Number seven, when traveling abroad to conduct, what item could you not leave home without? Well, I I travel very light. I've I feel like I've achieved some sort of ma Zen mastery of of traveling with as little objects as possible. Um, so I'm going to change the question a little bit and say, what do I need when I arrive? Okay. <laughs> uh, I can no longer stay in hotels. I uh, really thank God for I mean for all of the damage it's done to local populations. Thank God for organizations like Airbnb or you know where you can rent an apartment. I need to be able to cook in a kitchen. Um, you know, I need to be able to feel like I'm coming to a home because I miss my home so much when I'm away. And there is something so deeply impersonal about hotels. My father traveled all the time when I was young. And I remember him coming back and looking so haggard because he had just spent his whole time away in a hotel in some faceless, um, you know, personless space. And um, so being able to go to a place where I can live in what feels like a home has become so essential to me. Um, and if it has a smart TV in it, it yeah. so much the better. Uh, <laughs> a book of poetry that I often don't read, I almost always bring with me. Um, but well, I, uh, I so, like the change some... of the change of wording in the question. I like it because actually, you know, of course you can't take it with you, um, or you couldn't you can't leave home without it. But actually. It is. Uh, I think it's a fair. I will. I will accept it wholeheartedly as a ch the changing the wording. I like it very much. Because if you if you want yeah. a really sh really shameless answer, um, my wedding ring, because <laughs> I always I always kiss it just before I walk on stage. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that is my. If I if I if I couldn't do that, uh, I, I don't know if I could actually get up the courage to get on there and <laughs> and do the work. Number eight. This is a real or fantasy question. Uh, what is the one thing you would change about being a conductor? I would say as a young conductor, the lack of feedback. Mm. The lack of a, of a process by which you can go into spaces, work with people, and really hear how they felt and what they needed back from you in a constructive way. Um, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was doing all those concerts that, you know, people do in their 20s. And I would go, I knew the orchestra wasn't, maybe not thrilled to be doing it. Um, you know, I, it wasn't the kind of repertoire that I most cared about. And I often would go back to the hotel room afterwards and just kind of collapse. And then the only way I knew if they liked me or not is whether I got reinvited again. Exactly. I knew they were writing down long pages of commentary about me or maybe just, you know, D minus or whatever. <laughs> um, but I knew they, they were writing evaluations of me, but I didn't get to see them. And no. I would have, I mean, assuming my ego could have taken it, um, I would have loved to have known. And I was so lucky in my early life when I started working in Italy and in Israel, in those two places specifically, that I had people who came up and just decided from the orchestra to give me feedback in the most wonderful, loving, uh, comforting way. They'd come up and say, we really like what you're doing. You know, this is, by the way, this is how we think about this piece, or this is what we need. You know, I remember the first time I went to the Israel Philharmonic, I was doing my first ever Scheherazade. Um, was jumping in for Raphael Frubeck de Burgos. And I remember the first day I really broke it apart. And tried, And the prince, I remember the assistant principal cello came up to me and said, you know, when we do this with Zubin, we just show up and play it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, 
And so, and uh, almost in defiance of that, the next day I broke it apart even more. And yeah. then he came up to me after that second rehearsal and said, oh, actually, yeah, we really need to work on this. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, you know, yeah, I mean, Zubin has better tech, has the greatest technique I've ever seen. It, everything yeah. works and I have to work a little harder. And then every time I came back, he would take me out for coffee. The concert master in, in Florence, the Maggio Musicale, or in, in the Rye in Turin would take me out and we would talk about the program and talk about the season. And I would really get amazing feedback. And I wish that there was a process for young conductors beyond just a, a teacher in a workshop situation mm. um, who could who could provide that feedback. I think it's you only learn by doing and you only learn by um, understanding what musicians need and being empathic to them and being open to them. And I think I would I would change. I would try to figure out a way to to make a pipeline that could work. Yeah. I agree completely because at the moment the only way we get any feedback is if we have an agent or a manager as as I do I'm lucky to have who will get on the phone or email the next week and and ask for feedback but that feedback that comes back is official feedback from the it's official yeah it's it's, it's it's not the stuff that you know you it's not stuff that's going to help you it's not no. the uh, um <laughs> it's just um but that's the only way you get unless you're lucky like you have with individuals who, who will you know, take you for a coffee or, but then you're going, that's because you've gone back to an orchestra more than once, which sort of implies that you were doing okay in the first place, but being, so yeah, yeah it's that initial time. Now I agree with you totally. You, you live, you know, I, I remember going to an orchestra recently. I'm not going to say where and after the first day I thought, well, this isn't working. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I did the second day's rehearsal and it suddenly got better. And then I did, the, I think there was a third day. And then on the fourth day, we had uh, some concerts. And my agent said, You've been reinvited straight away. And, and I, she said, it, Yeah, quicker than anybody else. And, and after day one, if you'd have said to me, You're going to be reinvited, I would have gone, You're off your rocker. You know, <laughs> Give me a break. Yeah, because the look. And you're not even sure. Is, you're not oh, even sure you want to go back. Well, yeah. <laughs> is this working for me? Am I experiencing yeah, yeah. some kind actually, of satisfaction yeah. with this process? Yeah. But by the no, end, I, by the concerts, it, they, the concerts were great. And I, I, you know, we were interacting yeah. with each other and it was fine. But that that's what it's like for those who don't know that is exactly what it's like and even even if you walk away from there and you haven't been reinvited straight away your agent will then ring up or email and you get an answer back which is no yeah we quite enjoyed it we might you know maybe in a couple of years or yes we'd like to see you next year or well there would you know and then there there would be then there's a whole list of other official bullshitty answers maybe maybe this kind of repertoire (laughs) versus that kind of repertoire maybe exactly all you is this kind of thing yeah it it is tricky and i feel free to edit this out but i think that the danger of 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 the lack of that feedback is that when people who decide that they are conducting teachers give you feedback, it's the only voice in your ear. Yeah. And it can be quite damaging if it's not handled properly. The only conducting teacher I ever had, who I will not name, um, who tried to really um, get involved in my technique and my stick technique, the only thing he said to me every week, week after week was less, smaller, yeah. be smaller, over and over again. Mm. He would put scores around my podium so I couldn't walk around the podium. He grabbed my arms and fine. Yes, I understand. But after about seven weeks of only hearing be less of yourself, yeah, I didn't know what to do. And I remember there was one day where a very famous pianist had volunteered to do readings of like Rachmaninoff third piano concerto or something. And I'm conducting and it's going great and we're having a good time. And he, this guy gets up on the stage and starts yelling at me, less, smaller, smaller. So I get so small that I'm, you know, like Fritz Reiner, like you need a binoculars to find my beat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And finally he yelled at it again and I just stopped conducting and everybody laughed. Yeah. And he came up to me, I swear, he I'll never forget this. He came up to me in front of this very famous pianist and orchestra. He said, you know, you were doing really great until you decided to be an asshole. Lovely. <laughs> he thought that my stopping conducting was was somehow against him, but I was literally yeah. conducting so small. But there I was no, you had nowhere, nowhere else to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I and I just turned to him and I lost it. I mean, I I never get angry, and I never, I never, um, I don't hold grudges. But I turned to him and I said, "No one can work with subtraction. Yeah, I everyone has a fixed amount of energy. You have to tell me where else to put it. Yes, exactly. Or I can't, yeah. or I can't do it." And to his credit, he went home, he thought about it, he came back and he told me, 
he started giving me insight about willpower and eye contact and energy direction. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, where was this teacher the last eight weeks? Yeah. But that's the, that is often the only voice in yes. your ear if you don't have friends in orchestras, musicians, colleagues who can, who can really give you a, a greater sense of reality. So it's dangerous. Absolutely true. Number nine, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I'd love to be a theater director, like my father. I, I I thank God I never wanted to be an actor. I mean, I decided not to be an actor. I would have been dreadful at it. Huh. But I have I had a, a a soloist once say to me, "You should try directing, you know, Carion style. Like you should try directing operas that you conduct." And I've and and while that sounds so vainglorious, huh. I I think I would really love it, especially yeah. if I could do it with my wife, who is a brilliant dramaturg and and movement director. Um. I'd love to try it once or twice. You know, I saw Ivan Fischer's Figaro that he directed in in Berlin, and it was just marvelous. And and often conductors make terrible directors because we're so literal to the score. Yeah. And often you need a director to come in at a right angle and elevate something and move it into a different direction for you to 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 improve and and to expand as an artist. But um, I'd love to do that. And honestly, I I never thought I would enjoy teaching, but. That workshop I did in Glasgow with those student conductors was so joyful and it made me want to be a better conductor <laughs> at yeah. the end of it. I went back and thought, oh, am I re it, now that I feel like I might know one thing out of the thousand things I need to know, can I more deeply integrate that into my own practice and my own work? So I'd love to do more teaching. I don't know if a, a position is something that I crave, but I'd love to teach more. But I think, yeah, I love theater. I love storytelling. I always tell when when young conductors ask me what books they should read about conducting, I always say, read Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces. You know, learn about the monomyths, learn about the narratives that are in our subconscious across every culture. Because even if the composers aren't thinking that way de deliberately, those stories and those narratives are are in this music. And it will help you figure out this the 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 overarching story that you're trying to tell, you know. Finally, Ryan, it's my favorite question of them all. Not because it's the last one, it just happens to be my favorite one. If the world were to end tonight, what would be your choice of final meal and drink? <sighs> my son has discovered the would you rather game. So every day I get 400 <laughs> questions of would you rather have this or that? Yes. And the one that he delights in the most is, Daddy, would you rather have baked pasta every night or fill in the blank? Because yeah. he knows I'm always going to say I'd, I'd rather have baked pasta than literally anything else in the world. Um, although he did ask me the immortal question yesterday, Daddy, would you rather see an owl or draw a race course? Um, that I'm still <laughs> tr still trying to puzzle out in my head. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a bit of Dali in there. There's a bit, there's a yeah. bit very, very surreal. <laughs> you know, that does remind yeah. me, sorry, I, I know we have to end, but I remember it, that my favorite recipe in the whole world, and this is about music making, is a recipe from Miss Mary Land's book of Alabama cuisine. It was published in like 1965, and it's a recipe for owl. Right. And, and the whole recipe is defeather the owl, quarter the owl, and then fricassee it as you would a blackbird. <laughs> <laughs> and I I think sometimes, isn't this the way musicians talk to each other? It's like, can you just do yeah. that thing, you know, the thing that we do in the Ravel Mallarmé? Can we just like do that sound? You yeah. know, you just, the shorthand with things. Um, I, owl is not my answer. No. <laughs> um, I think if I had to end, if, if this was my last night on earth, I would have my wife's mushroom risotto, I would have my best friend Vanessa's tiramisu and I would have a bottle of Barolo from my favorite vineyard that's just south of Turin that I visit every time I go and, and work in the rye. Um, so I think that's it. And then probably just like one double stuff Oreo cookie. Yeah. At the end of it. That's kind of what I want to linger on my tongue yeah. when it all when it all comes crashing down. Well, it's an absolutely brilliant choice. Uh, lots of Italian food with Italian wine and no care about how much weight we're putting on, um, oh. you know, with with tiramisu and, um, and risotto. 
Uh, absolutely wonderful, Tris. And it's been a wonderful nearly two hours of chatting about all <laughs> sorts of things. I think with some topics, we could still be there now. and We'd never get oh, anywhere God. near the same questions, which means that at some point I will definitely be hoping to be somewhere down near Brighton or wherever you're working and we can sit over a pint and carry on chatting. Thank you, Ryan. It's been a real pleasure. It has been such a pleasure. Please let me know when you're in the area. It'd be great to have a glass of Barola with you. This has been a, such a joy. Thank you for this podcast and for the 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 archive of wisdom that you are compiling here. It's it's a great service to everybody. A mic on the podium was devised and produced by Michael Seal with music by Ben Dawson. Next time, I chat with a British conductor who studied with Norman Del Mar at the Royal College of Music and then went on to become the head of conducting there for 14 years. He then left the Royal College and concentrated on his own career, and since 2014 he's been the principal conductor and artistic director of the Goiás Philharmonic Orchestra in Brazil. But until then, bye-bye. <laughs>